And uh, before the panel starts, um, I want to say one or two sentences about uh, why we chose to choose this topic, especially today uh, during the COP. Um, on the one hand, climate change is, from my perspective, from the perspective of the Greens, um, the most the most important challenge that everybody living on this planet um, has to face today. And um, we have made an important step with the Paris Agreement, but there are more important steps um, which are far away, and this is the question how we made this concrete in something like um, exit from coal and um, change in mobility, change in agriculture. And I say this because uh, we discuss this not only parallel to the COP, but also parallel to the um, coalition finding issues that you all know um, are finding place in uh, Berlin today. And for us, for the Greens, um, it's one of the crucial issues from which we say um, only when there will be sufficient steps to um, achieve the climate issues, only then we, can we say yes to any coalition, especially to a coalition with the Jamaica parties, which are very far away from the perspective what we think is um, urgent to address these topics. I just wanted to say this because you all read the media and you all read about some compromises which we could make or could not make. And if there are questions which you want to address to me as a member of the German parliament, we could also discuss this, but I would propose at the end um, of the discussion, discussion round. And now the question why we are here today is because um, when we debate about climate change, there are some issues which everybody knows and there are other issues which are not in the focus of the debate. And from my perspective, the fact that climate change has a gender dimension is one of the facts that um, I think nobody knows in Germany. And um, I think it's a question of global solidarity that we, especially the women of the global north, but everybody in the global, global north, um, highlights this issue that women are more reliant on natural resources, that women are less mobile than men, that women are more affected by violent conflicts, and that women are unequal in the way in which they participate in processes of um, decision making. And when we want to address um, measures against climate change and ways how we can, can help people living in the global south, we should focus on the um, dimension of women especially. And for this, we chose to discuss this topic today. And I'm very glad to learn from you uh, what is necessary. Thank you. I am glad to be invited. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, for um, Catherine, for um, facilitating this. And I think that engagement with Catherine started with, uh, with that interview in May, no? Uh, for um, impact on, on impacts of climate change on women. And I would really want to build on that, and I think that's the the question that was posed to me. How much time do I do I have, Anna? Uh, like <laughs> five to ten minutes. Ah, that's too short. <laughs> we can discuss later. For right? the for the stories, because I think like um, the Philippines being um, an archipelago. Like we, we may be medium size um, in terms of the, the usual the 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 up uh, the land area, no? Um, they say that our land size is roughly equivalent to Great Britain, but we have actually seven thousand one hundred islands. Um, and they say seven thousand one hundred at uh, islands um at low tide. So it could actually be less at high tide. And um for many, for many um, islanders, those who live in the small islands, I think the the impact of climate change in a country, archipelagic country like the Philippines is really dramatic. No, um, it for some they wouldn't even attribute it to climate change because, like being an islander, you actually um, experience that through throughout your life. But um, in, in contrast to, to, to the past, like you actually see the change within your lifetime mm -hmm. uh, more than what your parents have had experience um, before. And as I mentioned in that um, initial interview with Catherine in May, like 
the Philippines being in that part of the Pacific, which is the pathway of, of typhoons, is no stranger to, to typhoons. Mm -hmm. Like we experience an average of 13 typhoons every, every year. And uh, for many school students, it's always uh, a time to look forward to because that's when they would cancel classes due to flooding and all that. Um, especially in, in the cities, now, some of the students would even welcome it without even realizing the kind of serious impacts it would have, particularly those living by the coast and also living in, in, in rural um, situation, in agrarian situation. Like um, the, the intensity of typhoon has never been this much. Um, in, in, even in my lifetime, I'm 49, but I've never seen so much typhoons that are so intense and so strong within my lifetime. And uh, when I say intense, it would actually wipe out um, even villages. Like we've seen in Haiyan in 2013, how it wiped out an entire city. No, with, with a typh super typhoon that we've never experienced before. And they say that was the strongest typhoon that ever hit land um, in, in, modern, in modern history. And I'm sure you've seen it in Germany, all those graphic pictures. But the thing about uh, media, about TV, is it only gives you a, an eye view of the devastation. But it doesn't really tell you the stories that people, uh, that people go through, the harrowing experiences. And to me, that, that, the, extre the extreme case of, of being victimized by a super typhoon like Haiyan may be good for, for media purposes. But for women and families in the Philippines who, who are in, the, in areas that are in typhoon paths, that's, an, that's a, a yearly thing that happens. There are even parts um, of the Philippines that actually people um, structure their lives around typhoons. No, like uh, you actually build your house um, in a way that it could withstand typhoon, but if you don't have that kind of money, you build a house that you, you won't feel bad it being blown away this year and you build again next year. Like there are even um, areas like in southern Luzon, Luzon is the biggest island, um, they, they say that people there would traditionally protect their... Um, you know, the, the, the pepper plant than their houses because that's, the pepper plant is something that is very valuable for cuisine. And this has impact on, on women. Mm -hmm. you know, like, um, it actually tells you a story that for women who have to live with typhoons that come 13 times a year, the first thing you secure is food. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what would happen to a pepper plant if, if it's not just wind that you have to protect against, but floods. And that, is, that has really um, severe impact on family um, food security, on household um, food security. And as we all know, like when we say how different do women cope, it's because in, in, in traditional, in, in families, whether urban or rural, the whole responsibility of putting food on the table does not actually rest on men. It rests on women more than, more than, more than the men. And this is even more dramatic in the case of the Philippines where you have an economic situation that part of the economic growth policy is to export labor. And most of the labor that we export as blue-collar workers um, in the Middle East are actually men. So you actually find a lot of, of villages where the farmers are women. They're the ones who are left. Um, in the farm to tend to small farms if they have a small land holding. So the men are, are either working abroad or working in the cities, um, in factories. So when they say it's men who actually bear the brunt when flooding or devastation from typhoon comes, in the case of the Philippines where you have villages, rural villages, where uh, women end up as the sole farming, uh, farming head of the the family, it's actually women who have to bear the brunt in terms of the decisions on what do you do if your farm is flooded. And that always happened more often than, 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 than before, you know? like flooding that severely affect, affect uh, farms, that you could actually save nothing. And um, the, Fili the Philippines, for example, we don't have crop insurance uh, policy. And whatever crop insurance policy there is, is not going to go to, to small-scale farmers who have nothing to, 
to um, present as a as a capital no for or, or or a premium for for crop crop insurance the crop insurance policy if there is anything that the banks can offer will always go to the large scale farmers or the or the medium scale farmers and in, in in the case of the philippines where land is um remains to be concentrated in the hands of few families like if a family owns three hectares you are okay you are still okay like you, meaning you can you can feed your family but no assurance that you can send them to 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 school like uh, the average um land holding in the philippines is about 1.3 um hectares and 1.3 hectares is just enough no to to feed your family but nothing to sell um into the to, into the local market mm -hmm. and if that's devastated by flooding and severe wind um during typhoon you lose everything you lose the food for the for the family and that's why you end up in villages that are that are actually that have female farmers because the the male would be the first ones to go um, either abroad, as I said, or to the factories to work there um, in the cities. And in situations of devastation after typhoon, so it's actually the women, the woman head of the family that would have to, to deal with the, with the consequence of that, like making decision on where do you get the food from, from, from the, uh, to, to the table to, to feed your children. I I think two years ago I was in I was in a village um, south of Manila about thirty or forty forty kilometers from Manila, and one thing that struck me was I was asking the the local guide because we were doing a, a research like why is it that there are so many farms that are not utilized like you see all these weeds growing, and the and the local guide was saying because nothing will grow there like we've been experiencing severe drought. Um, for for three uh, to four years um, um, in straight, so even the women have to go to the to the cities or to the urban areas to work in factories, and they would wait for the drought to to um, to to ebb to to subside, and they will probably go back to tend to the land. Mm -hmm. So that whole. Um, issue of problems in urban areas where you have overcrowding where you have informal settlers is very much related to the problems in rural areas and more more and more of this problem in the urban urban related problems will actually are actually rooted on climate change mm -hmm. because of severe drought and also intense intense um typhoons um, many of the poor families, especially those who have very little land holding or no no land holding at all, end up as informal settlers in cities. Like those of you who have been in Manila probably have seen the the seriousness of the problem of infor informal settlements. Where did all those people go? I come from. Like um, there there was actually an influx of informal settlement in. In Manila and also other um, cities in central part of the Philippines after Haiyan, mm -hmm. you know, that that super typhoon, because people who have lost everything, who have lost their homes or their shacks in those in the in the affected areas, would go to where the jobs are, you know, because there's no farm anymore. Either they have ended up um, eaten by the sea, or the the boundaries are just lost. So this whole problem of of control over land has become very severe in those areas because like even before Haiyan struck, um, there is so much insecurity in terms of land tenure. Mm -hmm. So when the typhoon, the flooding ate up the, the boundaries, like there's no, no landmark anymore. Like you would say before that my little land um, is marked by this little uh, post, electricity post, and then um, another house there, those are all gone. So... If it, it's a it's 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 a it's a nightmare even for cadastral cadastral survey. So of course the first to lose are those who have very little land holding, and where do they go? And the most logical answer would be they would go to the cities. They would probably have relatives there, and then they'll probably stay in their relative's house for a few months, and then they will be kicked out. They will have to 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 survive by themselves and build a little shack somewhere, so in informal settlement. So like I, I, I always meet um, women 
or even men um, in Manila who would say that they come from the area that was affected by Haiyan. So there's no job, no land. So they go to the city and find jobs because it's easier. It's, it's really easier to get jobs in the city. Like you can go to the market and, and volunteer to carry a sack load of sack or, or, or of goods and then you get paid like probably a dollar for that job. And you will not get that dollar if you stay in the high and devastated areas. So at least you have a dollar or two to, to buy something for your family. That's better than nothing. So all this um, relationship between urban uh, problems and the, the rural problems that are rooted as well or linked to climate change will become much more serious. Yes, there is a question uh, there. I have a question. Um, you have a, a, a female workforce who's migrating to Hong Kong on a big scale as well. So who would that be? Would that be also women affected by climate change or is that uh, women coming from the city, city centers anyway? So who, who would, would that be? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because we, we have been doing this export of domestic helpers in Hong Kong and Singapore. But you will be you, you would be interest, interested to know that most of the, the, the women that we export as domestic helper in Singapore and Hong Kong are mostly teachers, are actually professionals. Um, some of them nurses who cannot find jobs or teachers. Uh, they graduate from 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 teaching um, course and also even pass the license sure exam, but they would find out that it's better for them to up to to work as domestic helper because it pays better. You actually um, get some vacation which you will not get um, as a teacher, and you will get a job easily because um, it's not easy to get a, a job as a teacher um, in in the Philippines, especially if you graduate from a local um, school. So most of them are. Most of them don't come from the cities. Most of them come from rural areas. You know, like most farmers in the Philippines, farming families, the aspiration is to have a professional in the family. And it's always a pride for a family to have a teacher or a nurse or a priest, even better. Uh, none? Not as good as priest. <laughs> and then... Um, Oftentimes, they don't end up as nurses or teachers. They would end up as domestic helpers. So they, most of them come from rural families. That's always the profile. And they would be sending money to their families back home. And this is always a, a fascinating um, experience. Like I brought friends um, in rural areas no, coming from abroad. And they would see, wow, in the middle of this rice field, you have this huge house. Uh, made of concrete, very nice. Some some of them would even be inspired by, by like something Western, like maybe Italian-looking mm -hmm. villa, but compressed. And usually, more often than not, nine out of ten times, probably nine point five out of ten times, it's actually a product of of uh, remittance coming from a uh, uh, member of the family working working abroad, and. Oftentimes, um, those families would be the ones who would who would end up buying the little lands of the of the poorer families, like the owners of the 1.3 hectares, because it's hard to feed a family coming from 1.3 hectares would usually pawn their land, and these families of domestic helpers or construction workers in the Middle East would be the ones who would lend money, but if you cannot repay like you would end up in indebted and giving up your your land that's a common story in 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 the philippines but then um this uh it while it means um upper mobi mobility um in the in the social ladder it, it's not sustained most of the time because um even this uh, families of domestic helpers who accumulate some of their lands would have to bear the brunt of climate change as well like being not covered by crop insurance, no support from the government. If there's drought, they also bear the risk. And many of them would sometimes even lose the big house. Like I, I, I have a conversation with this friend who lives in one island in central uh, Philippines, and she would say, like, you know, many of those family who live in those big houses, some of them would even lose electricity connection because they would, especially when the family uh, member who works abroad lose, lose the job, 
they would not have any any money to pay for the electricity or some of them would even be be uh, uh, just uh, fending themselves um, to to with the very basic things like and the only thing that they would just say is like at least we live in a we, we live in a big house it's a house that will not be blown away by by typhoon so that's the only um, redeeming factor but it's really um, a common common narrative um, in in the Philippines and all of that you cannot say that's a, that's a phenomenon that is separate from climate change in in many cases those will be the, those um, situation will be aggravated by climate change because like even those um, urban problems as I said actually would have links with with what we have uh, been facing in the in the rural and agrarian um, context which are actually being challenged uh, more and more by the consequences of, of global warming, of climate change. You know, drought, intense typhoon, flooding, um, increasing, um, um, rising sea, sea, sea level. No? I, I, there, are, there are many stories I could tell about that, but um, Anna is winking at me um, <laughs> on, on time. And, but I, I, I hope we can, we can have... Yeah, um, we can have uh, more more time for for that discussion um, and that's just to start um, the, the sharing at this point thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you like she has already introduced to me I'm Dorothy Nalbega from uh, ecological party of Uganda, which is a green party in Uganda, and I am the coordinator for Africa for the Global Green Women's Network, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to share with you the stories of climate change in Uganda, how it, uh, it has uh, impacted us, first generally as the country, men, women, and children. It is so connected. Climate change hunger and poverty cannot be separated because uh, in Uganda for example the climate change has brought about drought in uh, a few years ago we had drought which led to famine and famine uh, led to to hunger the food production reduced even the animals were dying in the eastern Uganda there is a, co a place called Karamoja the, the, the dry season went on for, uh, for a long time and the animals were dying, the cows were dying, they had no water to drink, they couldn't yield and no, no milk, so the animals died and even the farmers cannot yield anything from the gardens. So the, the people had to migrate from Karamoja to the streets of Kampala and fortunately in uh, in, in, in your country, when they migrate to the cities, they can get jobs. But in Kampala, unfortunately, you can't just get a job just because you migrated and you can get a job. Most of those people are on streets, especially the kids. They became homeless. They're just on streets begging for money, begging for what to eat, and um, very sick. So the impact is real, real felt. And this impact leads to poverty, and that's how uh, climate change is connected from hunger to poverty, then there is no development. And when it comes to women, it's the worst. The women are more affected because these are the people who look after the children at home. They're the people who, uh, who contribute 70% on farms in, in Uganda. As the men go to work in offices, in businesses, it is the women who go to to the farms, and when there is uh, there is no the seasons have changed. Uh, in in Uganda, we used to have the um, April rains and August rains, and it was so planned that uh, children get their holidays in 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 April, and then they are on farms with their parents to to grow to grow uh, crops, and even in in in, in August. But now they're at school, when they come back in April to grow food, 
the, the, the dry season is on, yet it is not expected. So it's very, very difficult to predict when the season for, for growing food will be there. And this leads to low, very low production or no production at all. And you know, an, a, a hungry community cannot be healthy, and an unhealthy uh, uh, population cannot develop at all. This is how it has impacted on us. And for the women, go long distances to fetch water because uh, the wells are dry. There is no, there is no rain, uh, no rain, and this uh, when it rains, there is a way they harvest water for use but when there is no rain they have to go long distances to fetch water and between their homes and the long distances they encounter a lot of uh, a lot of things some of the girl uh, the girls are raped on the way especially during the dark because they have to come back from from school to fetch water and on the way you, you never know what, what they encounter we've had so many cases of rape of, of, of a girl child, even women. Women are, are also raped on the way because they have to go and fetch water. And uh, also women in rural areas in Uganda use firewood. So if they can't get firewood because of the, because of the drought, they, uh, it makes it difficult for them to cook for, that, uh, for the whole family. So it is really, really hard on them, and uh, uh, everything has been done, but the seasons, have, it's not easy to go back to the way it used to be, and it is really, really bad. Um, uh, since there is no time, uh, I'll go straight to the gender action plan. And <laughs> this, yes, if I want, I can... <laughs> Yeah, because uh, the reservoir is going to be connected to the to, uh, to 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 climate change. The gender action plan um, uh, for UNICEF specifies how UNICEF will promote gender equality, and is uh, grounded in the in the, uh, the 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 two conventions, the Convention on Children's Rights and the Convention on Elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And how is it connected? Um, the, the children in Uganda, which I'm talking about now and everywhere, about, uh, and everywhere suffer a lot when their rights are being, uh, uh, are being violated. In Uganda, we have a, we have a tendency whereby uh, children are raped by their neighbors or even people who tend to be uh, their relatives. But you know what happens? Even the parents tell them to keep quiet. To keep quiet. Imagine your child is raped and she's told to keep quiet. That is so, 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 so hurting. And you know why? Because sometimes they're afraid of the community. When you report this case, the, the, uh, sometimes it's an elder of the community, and instead of you saving your child, you're so afraid that the community will, uh, will be annoyed with you and will be annoyed uh, with, the, with the children. So with this uh, action plan, the, the, there is, uh, there's been, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's been, uh, Put up, they've put up uh, centers for these children to go. And the women, the women lawyers, who you can go and see for free to tell them your stories. And the prob probation officers at the district level, when you go to the probation officer, they find a shelter for you where you can be hidden as they, uh, 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 as they investigate your case. And this is all about the 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 the, uni, the UNICEF, and also the the girl child in secondary school. I, I, at first, there used to be uh, there never used to be free education for secondary school. It was introduced in Uganda, um, and uh, 
the girl child are now uh, educated, but the problem comes with sanitation at school. The, uh, when when girls go to school and they they can't find uh, they they can't find clean toilets, they get sick, they get infected, and they stop uh, going to school because of such, and even the sexually transmitted diseases, uh, the AIDS scourge. But with the unif safe programs, they have put up programs for 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 educating girls and boys about HIV AIDS and with the women the problem is about not being involved in decision making there are so many women in, in Uganda who would like to take a who would like to take up positions of leadership but because there is no support they fail they have to take up all the work at home and they spend more time working on farms, doing the work at home, and this makes them, uh, gives them less time to concentrate on uh, in politics. And when they're not in politics, when decisions are made, they, are not, uh, uh, they, they will not be made in favor of them. Uh, that's why we, we, we are thinking at COP that uh, women, uh, given more, 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 more time, and they are created uh, programs of of uh, empowering them so that they can involve, uh, they can be involved in decision making. For example, uh, if there is a decision that is going to be made on on climate change in councils, and there are no women, and yet the women are the ones in, uh, are affected directly. Then there won't be any, there won't be any change. So we urge all our fellow, our fellow Greens, other partners, to put up programs that will help empower women so that they take up positions, leadership positions. Because uh, why am I saying this? We may be in 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 women women groups, in civil society. But when you don't have power, there is no way you're going to make that decision. There is no way you're going, those decisions you want are going to be implemented. For example, there was a lady in, in, uh, in uh, women organizations, and she had very good, uh, very good suggestions, but she could just go in meetings, talk about them, and they stay on paper. But right now she's in council where I work, and she has uh, brought about. Uh, she, 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 she has been uh, bringing about decisions, and they have been implemented in, in in our local government. But that is because she's there in power, and she can say something, and she, she can be heard. But uh, uh, at first she was in civil organizations and. Uh, women groups and she just, they just discussed things and they remained there. That's why I urge fellow Greens to help uh, women to take up uh, leadership positions. On, uh, on climate change, for women in, in, in East Africa, the, women, uh, the Green Women's Network, which I, I, I lead as a chairperson, has got a strategy. And one of the uh, one of the uh, the activities on the strategy is to teach our fellow women to train them about uh, renewable energy and uh, clean energy. For example, when we get a chance, we go on and get trainers and bring uh, go to women groups and train them to use uh, energy saving stoves. Uh, it might look something that doesn't impact uh, directly all, but if someone has been using three woods to, to, to cook, and now with these uh, energy saving stoves, she uses only one log. She's saving two logs, and those two logs times three meals are six logs. Mm -hmm. And six logs times one, uh, uh, ten homes in that area uh, the, these are uh, the ones we use for cooking. Uh, 
yeah the yeah, trees yeah so if you multiply like that it may it may seem little with little impact but if you go on multiplying you will save like one uh, 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 ten homes will save like half a tree and then times that then we'll be saving trees and the uh, climate change uh, will not impact us uh, uh, negatively. So I think we, if we have a chance to tell, to spread the news and to teach uh, our fellow women about that, they also go and teach others, then uh, we'll have saved a lot. So uh, with that, I'll just answer the questions you ask later, but right now <laughs> I would like to stop here. <laughs> much for your for your inputs. I wanted to address now our third guest on the panel, um, Pega. Pega is um, uh, like the co-spokesperson of our federal working groups on global issues from the Greens and is also like following global problems, policies and the COP for years. And we just heard that um, it's crucial to also to address, to involve women much more in decision making um, structures. Um, you have observed the COP. Is it like are, are women really represented equally at the COP? How is it working? What what are they doing to improve that? Well, first of all, it is uh, no, they're not being uh, participating equally. I think um, if you, it's like twenty or thirty percent of the delegates are women, so <clears throat> there is no equal participation. But it's always good to look at things that work or success, so to get good energy and to work forward in that direction. And uh, I think the Gender Action Plan is a great success. That means that women actually did a good work networking globally and make it clear that we need instruments, especially for women, and we need more participation of women. So that is one success that we have right now, that the Gender Action Plan is going to be submitted or drafted in this COP23. And after that, we all have to work on that, that it will be implemented in the countries. So um, it's really important to have awareness on it, that there is a gender action plan, because I think a lot of people don't even know that. Can you quickly say what it contains? What, it, what is the Well, the gender action plan says that, first of all, you need um, more women delegates mm -hmm. that uh, are participating in politics. So um, you have the participation part, mm -hmm. and that you have need a budget for um, special like um, instruments or um, that that are you know um, uh, that actually do or you 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 uh, finance programs especially for women that when you have loss and damages that you um, yeah you do finance programs that are for women mm -hmm. in that way uh, sorry and. Um, so it, it needs more finance, that's another thing, because they're gonna do the gender action plan, but they're not gonna, uh, I think they're not gonna decide on how much money they're gonna put, gonna put in it. So the, another thing is that everybody has to work on, you know, or do lobby politics in their countries to really put finance or put money into that program so that they can finance actually a program, especially for women in countries that are affected by climate change. And um, yeah, so that's the gender action plan mm -hmm. and I think uh, it's a great success and we all have to work on the implementation. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thanks. Neth, do you also think the gender action plan is a success? And I was also wondering, you, you were talking a lot about the problems also women have in the Philippines or how women are affected by climate change. What is the Philippines doing or what is the international community doing to help especially women in your country to kind of cope with climate change? It would be good to, to see how the gender action plan will be implemented at the national level because like as I was discussing earlier, um, like when you talk of crop insurance as an adaptation uh, support no, for, for um, the impacts of climate change, nothing there that is, uh, that is going to be, that, that, that's been designed to cater to, to the situation of women. Like um, most of these programs are actually already in place and are actually guided by gender blind um, framework. I would I would say gender blind because they would there is not no reference at all, not to the specific needs and situation of women. Not even in a context like the Philippines, where you have this distinct situation as I was telling earlier that an economic policy actually result to a situation where you have. Um, rural households led by women making that decision 
and still you have government agricultural programs that are not catering to this specific um, situation. So it will be good to see how the gender action plan program can change that. Because like in, in terms of the political scene, like the Philippines has always been cited as an example of how women has been participating uh, politically actively, but for a Filipino, like for us, yes, of course you can count numbers, but look who are there. These are like children, wives, mothers, aunts of traditional politicians. Like the traditional politician would be serving his term of nine years maximum and will fill the wife to um, sit there for three years and then he will come back. And these are like children of politicians. Not that they're bad per se, but that whole thinking that only uh, children and scions of one family will be the, will be the, the, the leaders. And say that if you have women members of that, that's a check. You know, like it's like checking, ticking, ticking boxes. But in terms of empowerment, what does it mean? Because like if you have a situation where women are left to fend for themselves to deal with climate change, where is it? women's empowerment there? So also um, when you uh, ask, you no, know, like um, how do we? I I, I want to ask another uh, to deal another. Sorry, there's too many too many things going in my head. <laughs> like as um, that the discussion on women empowerment um, in the UNFCCC. Like I was part of a UN Women research on on looking at the gender aspects, gender responsiveness of existing instruments in the technology uh, sphere of the UNFCCC. Because I I've been looking at the technology issues in the UNFCCC for many years. I was also in the Philippine delegation, really focusing on technology. And we were shocked to know, like instruments like technology needs assessment were actually um, put in place, implemented by the UNFCCC since 1999 without any gender lens at all. They would just say it's gender neutral. So being gender neutral in the issue of technology is fatal. We, we, we've seen that. Like if you think that technology is neutral, <laughs> I think that there is really something wrong with, with, with how you think how the world functions. Like if you think that um, implements um, in agriculture that would help increase productivity in the situation of climate change and say it's gender neutral without thinking of the specific situation of women or not being gender responsive, then you might be uh, aggravating the situation of women. I'll, I'll give an example. Like um, in the past years, the Philippine government has been um, promoting mechanization in rice uh, context, mm -hmm. and the, the the one of the, the the biggest rationale is to increase productivity in a context where you have typhoons, flooding, etc. So like um, if you introduce mechanization, these, these big machines they call them rice combine. Mm -hmm. uh, they could harvest, they could thresh, and they're imported from. From Japan, like if there is a warning about typhoon coming, but the harvest, the harvesting is not yet there, you can use this machine, uh, do the quick, quick um, harvesting, which human labor would not be able to do. You can at least have some to, to save before the typhoon comes, or even after the typhoon comes. And the whole idea is to increase productivity um, in the context of climate change. So what happened in reality? I, I was shocked. I did not know about this until I was um, talking um, about uh, technology and geoengineering in climate change. And some of the farmers stood up and mentioned this. They called the machine monster. And they said, why? Because it has eaten up jobs. Yeah, it has actually displaced labor. And the first to go in terms of labor in rural, rural context is women. Because they're invisible. Like when I was talking um, about this um, in a meeting of UNDP a month ago, I was approached by one official and she told me she cannot understand um, the concern that I have because she said women don't work in harvest situation or har in harvest season in the Philippines. And I said, where? Do they, they, they work. And they are, they are invisible because they're not counted as economic, you know, they don't get paid as much and some of them don't get paid. Because like it's common in the Philippines, like if you do traditional threshing and harvesting, a lot of the grains would fall 
on the ground, it's common practice for wives of farm workers to be part of the team and pick up those grain. Mm -hmm. Like in one uh, day, they could probably um, accumulate probably a can, mm -hmm. and that can you can you can thresh it and then you can um, keep it for your family to feed your family for weeks. Mm -hmm. With the entry of this monster machine, it's so efficient that there are very few grains that would fell fall on the ground. So no need for women who would pick that up. So they're not counted as labor. And the, the woman official was telling me, telling me that, oh, not like not all of the labor went. Probably only 50% of them. I said, but in a medium farm, if you have like 10 and 5 goes, mm -hmm. that means multiply it by 6, you have 30 mouths mm -hmm. who will not be eating mm -hmm. or would eat less. And I told her that the first to go are always women. So, like, if you have um, a framework that says technology is neutral, you will have problems like that. That would aggravate situation of women in terms of access to food, ensuring nutrition, and all that. And those are not counted. Because what counts is the productivity increase. The increase in harvest, the decrease in post-harvest losses. But women's access to that kind of food which is free food for the table is not counted at all. A very quick question. Do you think this has changed a little bit with the new, like with gender being involved much more and more in the UNFCCC no. and in the COP negotiations? Do you think this gender lens is coming more and more or not? What I'm describing now is present. It's huh? present. Okay. I'm hoping that this will change. <laughs> with the, but you know, like, like when we were doing this research um, in the yeah. UNFCCC, I, I was actually shocked because like, yeah. I started my professional mm -hmm. life in the Ministry of Agriculture mm -hmm. when when the when the when the fashion was talking about gender in agriculture gender mm -hmm. god no they, they call it gender and uh, gender and development mm -hmm. god when all of the government ministries and agencies would integrate gender and development that was like 25 years ago yeah. or 30 years ago but it's still the same situation, but maybe it will change with, with the success of the, the... I don't want to make it too big. I just yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, always, it's always also too good, good to see that something is going forward. Yeah. You know, yeah. Still, it's least. the implementation that <laughs> yes, matters. Yes, and yes. I think that the lens as well, like you, you need to have that lens to be able to implement it properly. Because yeah. like uh, the that other part of the, the, the question, Anna, is like the adaptation yeah, probably, uh, we, probably yeah, you can yeah, come back later. to it because then, yeah, yes. we can ask uh, Dorothy first because otherwise, um, yeah, um, yeah, you you heard what <laughs> what Ness was saying. So, um, do you have, are you making the same experience in Uganda um, with like um, the government not having at all um, a gender lens in their measures they're implementing? And what are your ideas for adaptation for the problems women face and how can women better cope with climate change? In, in Uganda or in East Africa? The uh, thing is, in Uganda, I wouldn't say they're not doing anything about it. We have, uh, there is a program in Uganda, it is called Prosperity for All, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it is implemented at district level. I don't know what you call districts here, or you would understand what I mean, but uh, mm -hmm. it's at district levels. Mm -hmm. uh, women make uh, groups. <laughs> And when you make a group of women and like a women group and you're organized, you can go to the district and apply and then you can get uh, some funding from the district to go and use at the farm. But the problem comes in when, uh, when, when, when it comes to accountability, the women, because they were not trained at first, they don't know how to, to, to use this money Mm -hmm. and they go um they 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 don't plan for it so um uh the effect is it is not put its right use mm -hmm. and that's uh, and that's because they are not trained that is why i keep on saying uh before they implement any program it's better to 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 train the people who are going to benefit in that program but um, at least that uh, the government has done something about women groups. The problem is about decision making. Still, <laughs> I want uh, in 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 Uganda, 
and East Africa too. Mm -hmm. For example, I'll give you a, 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 an example of, uh, of Rwanda. What she said is true. When we talk about women being involved and we talk about numbers, it's not enough. In Rwanda, there are so many, it's known for having the highest percentage mm -hmm. of women in parliament. Mm -hmm. But what do they do? These are women who are put there by their boyfriends, all those big men in, in politics. Mm, yeah, a little bit like that, right? Yes. <laughs> and you know what they do? They don't represent the, the, the thoughts of their fellow women. Mm -hmm. they just, they're just there to satisfy the needs of the people who put them there. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just puppets, just to fill numbers in, in, in those uh, elected positions. But they're not doing anything about uh, about the the needs of women. So the thing of putting their women just for their sake, I think, should stop. And um, uh, our civil society in Uganda is teaching about that there is a, a forum for women in in, in democracy. Is uh, teaching women counselors about gender budgeting about decision making and um, the um, training them to go on and train their own fellow women about gender budgeting this thing it should not be about uh, we are going to construct a well in such and such a place how many people is it going to benefit it should be how many women are going to benefit from this and how many men and how many children so I think the government is doing something, but the civil society is also um, helping it a bit because these people from Forum for Women in Democracy in my district uh, put in money to train the women mm -hmm. even when the government cannot. So I think there is something that has been done. It's okay. just the training that is lacking. Yeah, it's good to also to hear some, some positive examples, definitely. Um, I still have a lot of more questions, but I see that also some of you um, are probably eager to ask questions. So I think it's probably a really good time to open up the discussion for, for questions. So please just raise your hands. And um, as Katharina said at the beginning, you can also easily ask the question in German if you feel more comfortable and can mm -hmm. translate. Yeah, Kelly? Yes, I have a question for the speakers and also for the audience. Um, my name is Kelly Yen. I'm uh, working for the Global Greens. And this month, just a couple weeks ago, uh, the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Report was released. Um, and I'll congratulate Germany for making progress, whereas most countries <laughs> took a step back. Not at the Bundestag, I think. But, <laughs> but your progress was, from last year you ranked number 13, and this year you're just number 12. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. yes. With indeed the Philippines being a more, have a smaller gap, according to the measures. Um, and what it found was that around the world, the gap between the genders in education was decreasing. But the major problem that's the gap is increasing is politics. The decision-making positions are getting worse and worse for women. Um, and as a newcomer to Germany, I'm really curious, why is it like that here, where we already have a social consensus on the value of gender balance? <laughs> uh, so like here, I was talking with the family I'm staying with, and she was explaining this to me. She said, we, we, if you ask anyone on the street, they'd say, of course, equality is what we want, that's what we believe in. But in many households, it's not practiced, or many jobs, or et cetera, et cetera. So um, in, in, my, in my job, I get a chance to visit many different countries. And I can say there, from what I've seen, that we're quite similar in the situation that we face, in that we're increasingly, increasingly developed. Um, nowadays, life is so expensive, both genders have to get a job, but still the traditions um, create new problems. Like in Taiwan, where I, where I grew up, um, women don't want to marry anymore because it's such a bad deal. <laughs> they still take care of the in-laws, take care of the, in -laws, uh, take, take care of the, the uh, economics of the household, and it's just too exhausting to marry. Um, and then they're not having kids, so it has one of the lowest birth rates in, in the world. 
Um, and it's not just Taiwan, so many countries are facing the same situation where there's just no, no time to have kids, no time to get married because we're working. Um, and then again, still, the women are not in decision-making power positions, including here at the UN, um, which actively promotes it. And even in the Greens, which puts it as a, as a core value to, to have gender equality. And whenever we, the Global Greens has an opportunity, funding or whatever it is, we always demand that there is a gender balance. And it is so hard, actually, to have a, a balance of nominees. So there's this cultural thing there. Um, so you get my point. <laughs> and, and I'm quite curious to hear from you all about what do you see is happening in Germany? Mm -hmm. uh, why are we still only number 12 in the rankings? <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge question, so probably anybody else of you, any who want to ask a question can also respond to that question. <laughs> um, or you can also just ask the panelists whatever you feel like. Yeah. Are, do you want to say something? Or because you're <laughs> striding to talk. <laughs> if you want to have an answer to this question, um, in Germany, men and women are equal by law, but um, there's this big cultural difference uh, which still exists in our country. Mm -hmm. And um, even the Greens, when you have one position um, and you look who applies, it's uh, mostly men who apply and women who have peaked. Uh, have to be convinced to apply for a position mm -hmm. and um, it's for example when we have direct elections that's just one job um, and it's mostly even with the Greens that um, is on brain and uh, if you look at the German uh, Bundestag um, the Greens and the left party are the one who have um, mm -hmm. equal um, Dele delegates in the Bundestag, but we have a rise of um, right-wing parties, mm -hmm. um, and um, especially the IFD, which mm -hmm. is um, an extreme right party, has only um, I think ten to ninety, uh, ten of ninety um, who mm -hmm. are women, and um, the CDU delegates few women and uh, the Liberal Party has also very few women mm -hmm. in their delegation and as those parties rise, um, the part of women falls in the yes. German Bundestag. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is the explanation because why we have only 30% women in um, the Bundestag actually, mm -hmm. which is a big problem in many different fields I think. Mm -hmm. And um, if you answer the question why um, maybe women are paid less in Germany or why the leading positions are mostly uh, filled by men. It's mm -hmm. because of um, the fact that women are giving birth to children and um, that the question of child care is also a big topic in Germany and mm -hmm. it's it are mostly the women who stay at home and um, are responsible for the children even in a country like Germany and for this um, they have less career chances and they are choosing jobs which are paid less like uh, jobs in caring mm -hmm. and education and not in the industry. Mm -hmm. It's also a topic here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you want to yeah I, that's, that's true and um, like a study showed that uh, women are more interested in informal politics than institutionalized politics mm -hmm. like they participate in demonstration civil movement, petition, mm -hmm. but when it gets to institutions, mm -hmm. the interest goes down. And then it was the question why? And it's because these institutions are dominated by man culture and behavior. Like one good example is the child, like a woman, uh, in Germany you still have a conservative way of thinking that women take care of their children, which is also good, but it's, it's you know, uh, and, and, but when you look at the, um, like if you want to make a career in politics, you have to have to take, go to so many meetings, and at night you have to go to meetings. Like in Denmark, after four o'clock, people go home. They don't, they don't have meetings after four o'clock anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it work because in Denmark you have seven percent women and men equally working. You know when they have families, but in Germany it's one percent of families that they're equally working, one mm percent. -hmm. Because after four o'clock, well, after they, they work for, they have to work for a long time. Yes. So, so it's, uh, that's one big issue. So if you want to have women in, in political institutions, you do have to change the structure. Uh -huh. You have to adjust the structure to women's behavior. 
it's not just enough to uh, encourage women and, and to say, go and do politics. Women really have to change also the way it works, mm -hmm. the way politics work. Yeah. I have a question for you regarding um, the women groups uh, you talked about who could apply at districts for funding. Mm -hmm. um, I, for me, it sounded a bit like, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounded a bit like uh, the microfinancing, which we know where we, uh, where lots of uh, money is allocated to developing countries where especially women have access to these programs. Mm -hmm. So why do you think there, there are programs in place, but the lack of the education, which you said, comes along with it, why does it stop there? Because the women are not in decision-making positions where you say, um, you cannot just give the funding, but don't give the education. So where's the, the imbalance of, we know we need to do something and we support women, but we don't give the access to the knowledge. So where's the, the problem with that? Um, the problem, the problem of uh, uh, women not being educated and uh, get funds for working and then they fail to put it to use. So I didn't get the question. Well, what is the question? Um, why the funds are allocated to women groups? Yes. So th you know that there is a need, or yes. women are, are kind of uh, promoted more in having the uh, possibility to access the funds. Yes. But why doesn't kind of an education program goes along with the funds? Because yes. Because they're not trained. But yeah. why are they yeah. not trained? Yeah. So why, why, why doesn't it stop at the education? Why are they throwing money at the women uh, at the groups, but not to the proper training in money, usage of money and... Yeah, I think because they, didn't, they don't know the disadvantage of, uh, of doing it. That's why these days when we, we, we get a chance to talk, we tell them not to just give people money like that. First educate them on how, how the money is supposed to be used, whether the money is supposed to be repaid back, or whether they're supposed to account for that money. At first, they just did it. That's why we said uh, 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 spoon feeding is not good. Teach, uh, teach someone how to fish than you giving them the fish. Eh? So when they know that the use of this money and how difficult it will be to repay it, or how difficult it will be to, to account for the money, then it, they will be more serious when using it so we are advocating for that as, uh, as uh, we, the feminists, we the, uh, the advocates for women's rights, we are advocating for that because uh, whenever they give them the money and they misuse it, they just uh, uh, ridicule, they, oh, women cannot work, see, see, see what we did? They said they want funds. And when we gave them the funds, see what they did? Mm -hmm. They never even put it to use. Oh, women are just like that. Yet they never trained them at all. So we are advocating for education for, for women. So it's actually used against you again? Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> if there's no other question at the moment, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we start here and then probably we collect three questions. So, I understood you need more teaching. Do you, do you have enough teacher who can uh, help the woman to uh, get uh, the business together? Can we, co we collect some questions here? Yeah? And I can just there with two other people. Yeah. 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 What do you want to do? Another question. Uh, also uh, for you, um, uh, I think that uh, the, the subject is uh, the relationship between gender policy and also climate change and other um, issues. Um, some months ago I read in the newspaper something about Uganda and, and, and I, I wondered uh, because in Uganda, despite all the promise you, you told, mm. um, there are also many refugees from from other countries like South Sudan, 
uh, Central African Republic and Democratic Republic of the Congo mm -hmm. uh, of all the wars and terrorist attacks. Uh, and um, I have read that uh, Ugandan people um, accept uh, nearly all of them, and despite of all the problems uh, you have, uh, and the, the drought and the, the climate uh, problems. Uh, um, I, I also think that uh, how, how, uh, how do you th think about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Catherine is still, and then we can. Oh, no, okay. Ah. Yeah. Well, you about it? Yeah. Uh, well, my question would be um, I'm very interested in um, the influence of um, especially German governmental organizations, for example, GIZ. Uh, if in your experience they contribute anyhow to uh, <laughs> gender equal process, because this is a, like the big aim. I worked with GIZ in Brazil, and there they at least try a lot. <laughs> but I would be very interested in your experience with um, German governmental organizations if they anyhow contribute to gender equality, and if so, um, what can they do better? Mm -hmm. Very good question. <laughs> Very relevant for us, also for the parliamentarians in the room. <laughs> um, yeah, probably you can start with the question on teaching and also on the refugees. Then I can go to that. Yeah. Okay, then uh, with the with the teachers, the teachers who are available need facilitation. You cannot just go and tell them, "Come on, I have a group of women here. Can you come and and teach them?" No, they won't agree. They want facilitation. So sometimes we get uh, help from organizations, especially the, the donors, but it's not so easy, especially when you're not uh, a, a, a big group or a local government. They, uh, if you're not so known, if you're just uh, a small group and you ask for, uh, for a donor organization for such help, they'll ignore you. And yet the teachers want money. They want facilitation in terms of money to come and teach about the businesses. And with the, uh, with the refugees, like the gentleman said, yes, we also wonder. <laughs> um, we, we think we are bad luck, but there are so many other countries which are, uh, are, are worse. Sometimes you may think you're hungry, but for you at least you have a meal to eat, at least one meal. But then there is some other person who can't even afford a meal. So when that person comes, uh, much as you've been crying, you also, oh, this one is worse, at least let me let this person in and we share. And uh, uh, another thing, uh, last month we were at the German embassy, they were celebrating a German unification day. I went as choir, we went to sing. <laughs> we went to sing the two anthems, the Uganda and German anthem. But um, the foreign secretary, was it the sec foreign secretary? And our minister for, 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 lo for local governments, they were share, sharing about the, the, what the two governments have done. So I think, Uganda only cannot feed or buy uh, medicine for, the, for refugees, but they get help from donors. What we do is host them and uh, do whatever we can do, but also with the help of the, of the donors. And um, there are some organizations like GIS, I don't know how, it's a, it's a German, uh, it's a German uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, such people, uh, such organizations partner with other uh, Uganda civil societies and they help around. Do you think they have a good, like, they have a gender focus or do you think they're gender sensitive? They are, most of the, <laughs> of the work they do mm -hmm. are gender sensitive because of the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they tell them to streamline uh, mm -hmm. gender mainstreaming. Whenever you, uh, whenever you put the, a proposal, mm -hmm. it has to be gender sensitive right from the beginning of planning, from the beginning of project planning. You have to look at the gender perspective, otherwise your project will not be funded.
Yes. <laughs> um, Nath, what, what can you tell us about like um, German or in general international organizations in the Philippines? Are, are they doing a good job or, or not? I'll also answer two questions. Yeah. On the teacher thing, in the experience yeah. of the Philippines, it's not the number of teachers or mm -hmm. doctors that's the problem. There's actually an oversupply of them. Yeah. The problem is how do you bring the teachers, the doctors, the nurses to the places where they are needed most? Mm -hmm. Like um, in, in the case of the Philippines, the most um, needy in terms of teachers and, and health professionals are the most inaccessible ones. Like I, I know someone um, whose family has a teacher and he is different from, from the rest because he actually went to this um, government, took this the opportunity for a government program that assists those who would want to go to far-flung far -flung areas. And he was telling us, because he just comes to the city like once a month, he says he has to cross two rivers to go to the villages. And what they would do is like they would wrap all their clothes um, in plastic. This is one of those few instances when plastic are very useful because you have to cross rivers um, like these are not big rivers but that so boats cannot uh, you cannot use boats but you have to really cross um, and then you spend the, the, the week there and then you cross again uh, after a week and she's, he said he, he, he's actually a, a gay man and he said that um, this is really something that would tests your passion as a teacher mm -hmm. and he said it, that it's sad this is these are the areas where the teachers are needed but very few would go there because of the situation like if you graduated as a teacher or passed the licensure exam the easiest way for you to earn back the investment is to apply as a domestic helper in singapore or hong kong or china because the criterion is to be a teacher so you can be a nanny and a teacher or if you want to ambition more, you can apply as an au pair in, in Europe, in Norway, for example. We have wasted so many teachers, nurses, yeah, um, in those um, areas. Wasted because they are supposed to be um, useful or beneficial to Filipinos that need them. So the question on the on GIZ, I've worked um, closely with the DWs, the, the development workers. Like I've provided orientations to DWs in the Philippines during their R&R twice a year um, meeting. And they are really very what impressive, R &R the meeting? rest and recreation. Ah. Like they have this rest and recreation meeting where they actually go for orientation on SDGs or technology or whatever. Very impressive um, in terms of absorption and integration mm -hmm. of gender, um, gender issues and gender orientation. But they all say that the challenge is how do you get this to be operationalized in the area where we were working. Mm -hmm. Many of them work with local government units. So of course there are programs funded by BNZ or DW, but then the implementation lies in the hands of the local government. You may have a gender orientation there, but again, it's an issue of implementation as I was saying. It's there in the program, it's there in the mindset of the DW, the development worker. But the real implementers, the local government, that's another story. So it could vary in, in different areas depending on the capacity of those who will, who will implement. Is it in the Philippines seen as a kind of Western thing that you have to do gender all the time? Or is it like, no. is it it's seen as an imposure of, uh, you know what I mean? Or yeah, is it like that's right. Um, because the Philippines, I would say, is different in that respect. Mm -hmm. Because like we are more matriarchal than most of Asia. Because they like, were more of Melanesia. You know, like the Pacific, we're more Pacific than, than, than Asian, actually. Mm -hmm. So the, this gender thing about women heading the family is, 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 is not something that is imposed from outside. But of course, when you deal with the nuances of like who really makes the decision, apart from being the boss or seen as the the matriarch, mm -hmm. like that that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So like all this gender um, orientation is, I would say, is not seen as Western. But mm -hmm. when you go into the substance of it, when it comes to who really makes the decision, who has the power in terms of the household or or politics, that's that's when you you get a different narrative. Mm -hmm. Pika, what do you think about the German development?
cooperation um, policy yeah, <laughs> yeah, but and it's it, gender climate um, sensitive. Yeah, well, um, I, I talked one week ago to Gender CC, that's a German, uh, well, it's an international network based in Berlin and they are connected to all other uh, climate female activists. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that the German government um, is paying for some project, but not that many. It's actually an issue which has to be, be more centered in mm -hmm. development politics, but also in um, climate politics, which is not just in, in development politics, it's also in the other ministry. Mm -hmm. And since women, um, they contribute differently to, to climate change, but they also have a different behavior, like women have a different behavior in mobility or in the way they eat or the way they eat, they're more sustainable than men. So there is actually, out of that could result in tr more interesting projects, like um, Gender CC is doing a project in Philippines where they work on mobility, on sustainable mobility, and they, the partners are women. So they are working on you know, more cities with bicycles, as we could write more bicycles. And these are like only few projects. I think you could do a lot more about that, because when we talk about development politics and climate change, it's always about, yeah, we have to transfer technology, you know, it's like technology issues so everybody can have the same lifestyle, but trying to technology to do something against climate change. But with women on your side as a project partner, you can actually work more on um, having a change of thought, more sustainable way of living. So mm -hmm. I think there is a chance to have, if you focus on that, you have a chance to have a lot more interesting projects. Um, to, uh, to fight against the climate change. So I think actually we should um, do more lobby for this to, uh, to get the German federal government to support more projects in that direction. Mm -hmm. Katrin, you had a question, right? Uh, two? Yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> um, first to the Philippines. What adaptive measures are necessary to slow down the impact of climate change and the coast because of sea level rising? Mm -hmm. And um, the second is to both of you, because we in the north we are still the biggest um, yeah, polluter causing the climate change. Do you have a message or uh, demands um, to our yeah, climate policy in the global north? We can check if there's other questions before. We What's move. the second question, Katrin? Okay. <laughs> um, do you demands uh, to the global north? Um, because yeah, we are still the biggest polluter and causing climate change. And do you have a message or demand to our government or to all of us? Is there any other question? Otherwise, yeah. I can ask a second question. Please. Um, it's regarding um, yeah, the conference happening right now. Uh, I'd be very interested if there is any, um, yeah, work on, on gender issues beside the gender action plan. So like not not only separated from the whole framework from the from working to working groups, but also within the working groups with the delegates, for example, in, in the issues of representation that, that you for example have, have an action plan or, or any plan to encourage delegates Delegations to to be represent uh, to represent more women, for example. For mm, now, we can go the other way around. Um, <laughs> I don't. I just. I, I just know about a lot of um, side events and workshops happening about that issue. That's that's what I know. I don't know exactly if, what you mean, but because there's a lot of. Uh, workshops about empowering women. Like Monday, there is a big panel with twenty women talking about. But that's that's the side events. I think you mean I think inside. I directly on the delegates okay. or, or the two working strings. Mm -hmm. like okay, I don't know. No, I'm, I don't know if, if any of you know. Yeah, I mean, for any of you can probably answer this question. Also, the others from from Kathleen. It's not clear to me uh, about the core of the question, like gender in other streams. Yeah. If it's really in the negotiations, right? Yeah, that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Because I can only answer from the technology negotiations which, I, which I've been following. Definitely no space there or not, no discussion <laughs> on gender at all. As I said, like even looking at the instruments that have, that have been used for the past 20 or so years in the climate convention <coughs> remain to be gender blind. They call it gender neutral. But if there is anything 
any such thing that exists. Like, and to me, this is really very, very concerning, particularly in the technology um, sphere. Because as you go into the discussions that we're having now after Paris, like 1.5 degree, like you actually see a bigger role that's being placed on technology as a solution to save us from hell uh, caused by global warming. It's not um, discussed that prominently, but it's like the elephant in the room. Like much of the discussion on mitigation and adaptation has been so linked to um, technology in reality. If you go to the operational part, like even talking about cook stoves or wells or or mitigation or mobility are actually technology related, but no discussion on gender aspects. Again, that is being gender neutral slash blind, which would actually work to the disadvantage of women. No, like. Um, because the, the, the concerns of the, and the situation of women are not taken into account. Uh, and when I say um, gender responsiveness, it's not when the technology is already there. Like even the whole idea of designing a technology to respond to climate change, either adaptation or mitigation, would need to have women from the beginning, from the design. Because like, you know, that, like the monster machine that I was talking about, like if, if women were part of that decision, it wouldn't have turned out to be like that. Mm -hmm. Like it, the whole um, thinking would be different. Like I always, remind, I always get reminded of the cook stove example. Because the cook stove, um, the, the solar cook stove has been uh, promoted widely in Africa. Mm -hmm. I was talking to some women uh, working with uh, Energia, and they said that, the initial resistance to the solar cook stove is because they're so small. Because in reality, like a woman would actually cook for the entire household. You don't cook in a small thing, you cook in a big pot. And they said they had to do those um, innovations on the solar cook stove to respond to that. That's cultural. Like if they probably involve women from the beginning, it would be huge. So, but what? Huh? Not the small tiny thing. Because I was given a gift of that mechanism. Companies, like even for rice, like for a family of four, this would not feed four. So it's so it's so solo, you know. Like you, you could see the Western thinking on it, like so. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a judgment, but it's really cultural. So those things, and I, to me, that is really very, very important, but critical in the technology discussion, both adaptation and um, mitigation, which brings me to, to the to the uh, questions of Catherine, like the adaptation uh, programs, of course, are very critical, not just on the issue of letting women uh, cope with the, the complexities and the implication, but it's really a survival issue. Huh? Uh, and to me, like, I, I, I will tell more stories like, to, to, to show this. Like, even for me, this, these are eye-opening stories. Like, uh, I think two months ago, I was with a Malaysian friend who was visiting me in Davao. I live in southern Philippines. And there's an island off Davao, like just 10 minutes boat ride, and you're there in that island in Samal. And this is very typical small island in the, in, in, in the, in the Philippines. And I always love uh, bringing friends there because the world's biggest colony of fruit bat is found there. <laughs> and uh, we were sitting um, by the beach and watching how uh, boys were catching crabs underneath the, the rocks. And then I was telling this friend that, you know, there is a, a, a stream, a, a spring, freshwater spring by the beach. He said, no, I don't believe you. That can't be. I said, there is. But we cannot find it. But apparently, I was telling her that about the spring on the high tide. So it will only come out in the low tide. But anyway, as you were waiting, uh, women with, uh, this was a Saturday, carrying lumps of clothes came. So they were there to wash their clothes by the beach. And I was telling them, there was a fresh water spring here, right? And they said, yes, yes, there is. Just wait for the low tide. So we waited for the low tide, and they started uh, clearing things. And they said, this is the spring. This will become bigger as the low tide uh, uh, matures, no? And we, this is where we wash our clothes. And I asked them, where did you come from? And they said, from the hill. They said, we walk like three kilometers down the hill to the beach to wash their clothes. And I said, you do this every every weekend? They said, yes. Like we do this even much more now because there's no water there. 
They said it's so they have rallied their politician to build a well, but then they have already uh, um, accumulated so much support from politicians. Still, they could not reach the source of the water. They said it became deeper. Mm -hmm. Like before, we used to get some water, like not good for drinking, but good for washing clothes, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. They said the water has, the fresh water has subsided. Like even this spring, they said, uh, the old woman was telling me that when she was young, it's easy to find the fresh water spring. Mm -hmm. But now it has become smaller because the sea level is eating up, no, the, the fresh water. Thing. And to me, like, God, like, uh, this is survival issue. Like, we talk of mobility, you cannot even use bikes there. And she said, I have to um, ask for money for my um, son so I could pay for this. Um, you know, we have this tricycle, talking about mobility, like the different ways uh, people um, in the rural areas in the Philippines cope with their situation because it's slopey, you cannot use bicycle. So they actually have some contraptions attached to tricycles to, to make it carry more people. Like we have this thing called Habal Habal, you have a um, motorcycle. Like you get a big plank of food and put it across the motorcycle. This motorcycle is here, the big plank is here. You carry more people. You know, like you have people here. It's very dangerous, I tell you. I wouldn't even try it. So she hires that to bring the clothes to the, to the spring. And she said the spring has become smaller. It's harder to find across the like. We saw some very toxic venomous stones, not just uh, snakes mm -hmm. under the stones, just for her to find where the spring is. Like this is for me a very basic thing. Mm -hmm. Like how do you adapt? Like uh, in a situation where there's not even fresh water to provide to to these people. Mm -hmm. Like do you bring them somewhere? Like you you will have to confront. To, to confront these issues, not a very political um, question, because it's an issue of, of inner migration, like do you bring them outside of the, mm -hmm. of the of that island? Mm -hmm. And to me, um, you cannot discuss the issue of adaptation without discussing it in a bigger development plan. Like that island has become a favorite of tourists. So you have all these big resorts coming up, uh, that came up in the past five years. Mm -hmm. So, and they are the first ones who would benefit from whatever available fresh water you can get because they have the money not to dig deeper, to actually get bigger pipes and all that, which these this poor people don't have up in the hills. So you deal with adaptation in a situation where priority is tourism. It's not the survival of women, of poor women. So I, I think it's really uh, going to be very artificial if you just discuss adaptation mm -hmm. per se, but you have to see, look at it in a bigger development framework. Mm -hmm. That's a long answer, but I have another question. I, this is important, this question <laughs> on the global, on the call. Like to me, while I was listening to you about uh, institutional uh, limitations, so like why men thrive in institutional setup, this is very clear to me in the situation of technology. Yeah. Why is it that in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is so dominated by men? Because mm. it's them who can stay up until midnight in their laboratories while women have to go home, uh, tend to the children, and all that. that that's clear. And even despite all the attempts no, in industrialized countries, especially, to encourage more girls and women into STEM, it's still dominated by, by men. Mm. And that, to me, pro presents a big problem because you have technologies presented a solution to climate change designed by men thinking that they, this will be used by men it's not just blaming men but also like what kind of world we are in what kind of technologies we have, or tools are we using to deal with, with with climate change like talk about the big solutions like geoengineering like it's definitely dominated by men thinking about how to save the world from global warming. So if they say if you cannot address, because I, I, this is related to the global call, of course we continue to call for genuine mitigation, um, cuts, and also change in lifestyle. But then you have all these solutions being presented as false, fix, as fix, that geoengineering will save us. While until we, we change our lifestyle, we will cool the planet. They have this um, solar radiation management technology 
that they say will address global warming. And all this idea about, like, I, I have to, to sorry, and I have to, to yeah, take out more time. To slow <laughs> you have to get you off. Yeah. No, because, like, this whole idea, like, who, who among us would have thought that uh, a massive eruption of a volcano in the Philippines would inspire a technology called solar radiation management? In 1991, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines, the ashes actually reached as, as far as South Africa. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it cooled down the planet by 0.5 degrees over two years. Mm -hmm. So all these Nobel Prize winner like Paul Crutzen thought that if we can copy a volcanic eruption, then we have a solution for global warming. Mm -hmm. sure. Like 0.5 degrees over two years, so let's mimic mm -hmm. the eruption of a volcano. So this whole idea of a solar radiation management um, as a geoengineering fix to climate change came about. And we thought it's just science fiction. No, it's not. It's real. And they're investing millions. And this is, this is my response to your, to your, to your uh, question. Like the call to industrialized countries is just to cut emission. Don't, don't present false solutions that distract political will, that also divert scarce resources. Like Harvard, for example, is going to, to do their field experiment on this by 2018. $20 million. Imagine how many wells or how many people who have to travel three kilometers just to wash their, their clothes every weekend would be lifted from that situation with $20 million instead of wasting it in a balloon experiment to show that you can mimic a volcanic eruption to save us from global warming. So... That's my answer. Uh, Dorothy, do you, do you agree with her? Very complex answer. <laughs> but for example, especially with the last call on, yeah, don't present false solutions, but please just cut your emissions. Do you, do you agree with the statement or you have another approach? No, I would, um, I would, actually, <laughs> I would actually agree with her, but I, I, I have another call. Yeah. Since, um, since uh, you, you are also the manufacturers, we talk about because uh, uh, even in, in in the globe in, in the global north it started like that with the behavior change so we may think that in, in uganda we don't emit so much or, or we don't uh, we we try to save energy just because we don't use heaters but even the small that we uh, the small things that we do um at first we used to have bulbs bulbs of 100 watts mm -hmm. then uh, the energy savers were also manufactured and we advised uh, people were advised to use the um, the energy savers and now they are what we call the lead bulbs mm -hmm. those lead bulbs uh, save a lot of energy so my call to to the uh, global north is to to put so much money in fact manufacturing such things that save energy so that in the global south we we start early mm -hmm. before things get bad and i also uh, uh, i also urge the global north to um <laughs> to please think about the alternative alternatives of uh, the people who lose their jobs, the people who lose their jobs, because I, I thought this was also important. We preach the uh, we preach the the uh, we preach about using electric uh, buses, trains, but do we even think about those people who have been working with the in those buses? If they lose jobs, so if before it is too late, before we, we should think about these people if they're supposed to, if, they're, if they will at all agree with what we are saying, mm -hmm. we have to give them alternatives because they will mm -hmm. not support us. Someone might know that it's very dangerous to drive, to drive a car, to, um, uh, uh, to emit. For example, in Uganda, if, some, uh, if a family is somehow rich, mm -hmm. They will not even think about uh, riding in a in a public transport. A woman will drive, a man will drive, and the first son will also drive. 
without <laughs> thinking about the cutting the emissions. Mm -hmm. There is a question from me. Yeah, how do you defend that you came by plane to Germany? <laughs> I beg your pardon? How do you explain that you came by plane? Germany. It is bad, and I know it, and I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't deny it. Okay. That's why I'm saying that I don't blame. Uh, 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 I'm not blaming only the global north. Even us back in Uganda, we must change our behavior before it is too late. That's why we have already decided to start on telling people to save energy by telling them about using energy savers and lead bulbs with safe energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for these two uh, calls. I would probably slowly conclude the discussion and head over to Katharina to do the final remarks, right? Um, but um, already know from my side, thanks for the interesting questions and for listening and um, for the great inputs. It was a very inspiring discussion, I find. Um, but Katharina, I yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting um, discussion and um, I think your last call, cutting the emission, um, sa saving <laughs> energy and changing our behavior, these are the big issues which we are facing here in Germany, which the whole planet is facing and which is one of the reasons why the Green Party exists. And uh, <laughs> so um, it was very interesting to listen to you, to learn from your experience. And we have a small present uh, for you because one of the topics we're facing here in Cologne is bringing the agriculture back to our city. And so we are very proud to have um, especially bees in our city which are able to make honey. And uh, in my constituency, <laughs> there's somebody from the Greens who's making honey and I brought it with you just as a small present and some other things. <laughs> but um, I think greening the city is also um, a tribute to climate change and uh, to fighting climate change. And so um, I brought this small present. And thank you very much. Thank you for coming, for your questions. And if you have other questions, you may address them directly. And uh, vielen Dank auch nochmal auf Deutsch an alle, die gekommen sind.